Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your many, many good gifts. We praise you for your provision and the abundance we experience. Please help us to live with thankful hearts, knowing that you are our provider and our sustainer, and that you will never leave or forsake us. Help us to share that spirit of thankfulness with those around us, And help us now as we look at your word to understand why we should be worshiping you all the time because of who you are and because of what you do. Now may my words be your words as we seek to learn and grow together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are coming up to Thanksgiving this week, obviously. And sadly, I think we've all seen how Thanksgiving is becoming a minor holiday today. It's just a blip anymore on the way to Christmas for most people. You know, it's just the day before Black Friday when you get all these fabulous sales for Christmas. It's the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade where everybody wants to get to the end of it because all the kids know Santa Claus rides on the last float. Yeah, we still gather with family and have a lavish meal. Perhaps you've bought all your supplies already for that and are planning that out. Maybe some of the baking's already been done. Who knows? And we still watch the traditional parades, of course, although I think if I saw the stories correctly yesterday, both Scranton and Wilkesbury had a Christmas parade already. <laughs> You know, it's somewhat sad, really, because Thanksgiving used to be a far greater holiday for people in this country than even Christmas. I know that's hard to believe, but if you go back 200 years, the big fall celebration, fall and winter celebration, wasn't Christmas, it was Thanksgiving. It was a time of special worship services in every community. And I've been in churches in the past where there was an 8 a.m. Thanksgiving Day service so that people could come and worship God and thank Him before they had to rush home and start cooking. It was a time of pilgrim reenactments and school pageants all about the first Thanksgiving and everybody made you know their little paper costumes and did their you know popsicle stick turkeys, popsicle stick, paper plate turkeys that they'd bring home from art class. It was a time to reflect on the bounty, on the peace, on family, and of course, on God's goodness. We've lost some of that. But as our nation has moved away from God... It's no wonder Thanksgiving has become greatly diminished. See, much truth has been all but lost about the faith and the endurance of the pilgrims. Many of the miracles God did to help them survive and eventually thrive in the new world are no longer told. And as I mentioned to the kids, Squanto... The lone survivor of his tribe was one such miracle. He's somebody who should have died along with the untold other numbers of people who were mistreated in history. And yet God had his hand on this man. And even though he was dragged away from his home, if he had stayed, he'd have died in a plague with the rest of his tribe. And he should have been stuck in Spain, sold off to some... Probably some Arab merchant who would have taken him to North Africa and made him a slave the rest of his life, as thousands of other Native Americans were done, had done to them during that time. But God intervened, and these, I think they were Franciscan friars, found him, paid his, his ransom, and brought him to Christ. And he would have been content probably to just live there in Spain with the fathers and been part of their ministry. But God impelled him to know, go back to England. Maybe you can go back home. And he connected up with people who were merchants traveling across the North Atlantic in these rickety wooden ships during that time who were trading with the Native Americans. 
And he was valuable to them because he could speak the language. He was a translator. He was an intermediary. He could keep them from getting killed by Indians who were suspicious of these Europeans who were often brutal to them. And he made his way back. And when he gets back, he finds out none of his tribe is left. He could have simply stayed with Samoset and his tribe and we'd have never heard about him. But it just so happened that these pilgrims, these separatists who didn't want to be part of the Church of England had struggled to found a new colony there in what's today Massachusetts. And Samoset thought that Squanto would be a good help to them. And suddenly Squanto has a new family. People who appreciated him. People who he could help survive because he knew how to grow crops in the New England climate. He knew where the fish were in the ponds. He knew where the game was in the woods. They didn't. You know, the pilgrims weren't this bunch of rugged outdoorsmen and explorers. They were merchants and shoemakers and, and cobblers and, and carpenters. And, you know, they, had, they were just tradespeople. There was nobody wealthy. Nobody who was a, a professional adventurer among their group. So if they didn't have somebody like him, they'd have died out and we'd have never heard about the pilgrims. But God had a plan. William Bradford, the governor of the Plymouth Colony, in his classic historical account of the history of Plymouth Plantation, describes Squanto as a special instrument of God sent to help them. He recognized it for what it was. In fact, at one point during his life, Squanto was kidnapped by another Indian tribe. Bradford was so upset about that, he called Captain Miles Standish, who was a military man with them. They organized a rescue party of 10 or 12 guys who were armed soldiers. And he gave them one order. Bring back Squanto alive, or if he's dead, avenge his death. And they went out and they rescued Squanto and brought him back. Or again, we'd have never heard about him. He'd have been dead. He was just one of the many reasons why the pilgrims wanted to have this special first Thanksgiving. To thank God for all he had blessed them with on this bold adventure he brought them on. Times of hardship and privation, of terrible cold, of terrible hunger, of disease. And yet they managed to get through it all. It was their faith and trust that helped them lay the foundations for this nation. To impart to future generations the Christian faith and the freedoms we still enjoy today. If you don't believe that's true, read the Mayflower Compact, the document they all signed as they began their colony. So why isn't Thanksgiving a much more important holiday today, given this history? Are people no longer as thankful as they used to be? Previous generations had it far worse than we do today. Today we have better medicine, more abundance, more food. We have more technology, we have relative peace, and we have more wealth than at any other time in our past. We should be the most thankful generation, shouldn't we? This nation still has one of the highest standards of living of any country in the world. There is no mass starvation, no mass disease, no unending war for us to deal with, as hundreds of millions of people deal with every day in other places in this world. The pilgrims in coming here gave their following generations a far, far better life here in what would be America than what their relatives had back in England. And even those in Holland would go on to experience even after they were gone. From their faith, we've been blessed to be part of the greatest nation the world has ever seen. Yet, we still see more and more people today who are unhappy, who are angry, 
dealing with all kinds of substance abuse problems, mental illness problems, just miserable. We keep seeing one group after another coming forth with a list of grievances and supposed ills they claim to be suffering, demanding radical changes be made in how our nation operates to satisfy their goals. We see some young people who can't cope with the stresses, even to the point of needing what they're calling safe spaces on college campuses, where they're free from hearing any ideas they might disagree with. Because that makes them upset if somebody doesn't agree with them in everything they believe. Why is all this happening? And what does it have to do with Thanksgiving? It comes down, actually, to rebellion against God. And all that means in the culture. You see, whenever man tries to make himself a god... That's when he's the most unhappy. And if our world revolves just around ourselves and giving ourselves satisfaction and and making all the decisions for ourselves and not worrying about anybody else, we don't become satisfied. We become, become miserable. Because you see, we humans make lousy gods. And even though we often revere celebrities and politicians and sports figures and other famous people who crave our devotion, what we find is they are usually the most troubled, the most insecure, and the most shallow people on the planet when it comes down to it. And that's what happens when you try to set up an idol in place of God. No, Thanksgiving has been diminished in this nation because we've forgotten the God who has given us all of our blessings. And the only thing that will return sanity, tranquility, and peace in our souls is to return to God with the spirit of thankfulness. Let's look at what the psalmist tells us about why we should be praising God and being living thankful lives. Let's look at Psalm 92, 1 through 9, briefly this morning. The psalmist begins. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. That should be the state of our existence if we're in relationship with God. That we praise Him and we thank Him and we worship Him regularly because of all that He's done for us. All that we owe Him. And not just once an hour on a Sunday morning. No, verse 2, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. So he's saying, live in a state of thankfulness. Live in a state of praise with God. Trust Him throughout every day. And He won't disappoint you. Praise Him with the ten-string lute and with the harp, with the resounding music upon the lyre. Worship is a good thing. Music is God's gift to us to honor God. That's why we have musical instruments in our church. That's why we have a choir. That's why you have opportunities unlimited out there today to pull all kinds of wonderful Christian music into your lives. No matter what type of music you like. Because it puts us in a state of worshipfulness and thankfulness and peace. The psalmist understood this. Verse 4. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by what you have done. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. That's a thankful life right there. That somebody can just look around them and see all of God's blessings. And it causes them to raise their hands and say, Thank you, Lord. Praise you for what I have. Praise you for what you've made. That's somebody who the world isn't going to knock down and make them feel depressed and upset and angry. Verse 5. How great are your works, O Lord! 
your thoughts are very deep. That somebody has looked at all that God has made and says, thank you. Thank you for giving this to me, for helping me to experience part of this. And you know, in our day and age, we should be more thankful than people who came before us in previous generations. Because we have more technology today to see far more of God's creation than anybody ever could. We have this amazing satellite floating around in space with this huge telescope on it that can see untold distances into the universe. And the more they see and the more pictures they take, the more amazing things we see of galaxies and and star clusters and different kinds of heavenly bodies all over the universe around us. Everything unique and special. We have the ability to zoom down almost to the to see an individual atom with our technology. We've been able to take apart, to some extent, the very building blocks of life and to examine our DNA and see how it amazingly works. That every tiny little cell in our body is like a miniature city with all these different parts that have to work together so that we can continue to live one second longer. Nobody in history could see all that like we can. And the more you look at that, the more it makes you want to fall on your knees and say, Thank you, Lord, for what you've made. And yet, why don't more people do that? Well, the psalmist tells us that. A senseless man has no knowledge. Nor does a stupid man understand this. So people who don't have God don't understand what God is really doing, what he has done. And they don't understand what? Well, he's going to tell us. That when the wicked sprouted up like grass and all who did iniquity flourished, it was only that they might be destroyed forevermore. So that when people wanted to praise the greatness of rulers and to show their tribute to tyrants, God is saying, they're going to be gone. They can't stand in opposition to me. They can't spit in my face and expect that they're going to thrive. We've seen this over and over and over again in our history. Whenever a a world leader has come to power and wanted to dominate the entire planet, eventually they end up You know, exiled to the island of Elba, being an almost nobody, or commit suicide in a bunker as all the forces of the enemy are surrounding them, or dragged through the streets by the angry mobs that they created and are executed. That's what he's talking about. They'll be destroyed forevermore. The contrast, though... But you, O Lord, are on high forever. You reign. You will never be deposed. Your truth will endure without end. He's the only God. The only one worthy of our praise and thanksgiving. Then he concludes this section by talking about the future. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies will perish. And all who do iniquity will be scattered. That's the fate of the person who rejects all God has given us. The psalmist doesn't want us to live there. He doesn't want us to glorify sin and evil no matter how well it's dressed up in costumes and finery. He wants us to focus on the true object of what we should be thankful for, and that's our Heavenly Father. So when we gather this week with family and friends, let's stop to remember the founder of our feasts, so to speak. That's our Lord. Let's worship Him for His many good gifts. And let us reflect on all the many blessings He has given us in this past year. 
See, we tend to look back on the previous year and become reflective on New Year's Eve, don't we? But perhaps it should be Thanksgiving as we remember all of the things He's helped us to get through and overcome, all of the blessings we have, and all of the future possibilities He may have for us. We can recover the beauty and the significance of Thanksgiving if we practice this thankfulness every day of the year. Because we have so much to be thankful for today. And... We have even greater things to be thankful for in the future. That's the best part of our faith. It's not just about the here and now. It's about all eternity. When Squanto was struck down with sickness, and he knew he wasn't long for this world, he asked Governor Bradford to pray for him so that he might go to the one true God when he died. And, of course, Bradford did. And a few days later, Squanto died, trusting his soul to the Lord Jesus. And so he's been part of the kingdom of God for centuries now. Maybe you get a chance to meet him and talk with him in heaven one day. We have the same hope in Christ. Our futures are sure. And nothing can take that away from us because of God's love. And if that doesn't make us thankful, then nothing can. So let's celebrate Thanksgiving. Let's spread that message to others. Maybe it'll put people in a better frame of mind for Christmas if we do. (laughs) But let's not rush by it. Because God deserves our praise and our thankfulness. So to everybody, I wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. I pray that your time with your family will be wonderful and joyful and thankful. I pray that the food will be great. I pray that everybody will be safe. And I pray that it will be a time when families can gather together to praise God for all that he's done. Let us pray. Father, we truly praise you for your goodness, for your mercy, and for your love. We are thankful for all you've given us and all that you want to do in our lives. And we praise you for giving us the strength to get through the hard times, the wisdom when things seem to be confusing, and and the peace when things seem to be terrible. We thank you for giving us comfort when we mourn. We thank you for giving us peace when we're afraid. We thank you for giving us strength when we're weak. And we thank you for this amazing abundance that we have in our time and age right now. Please help us to live thankful lives all year long. But especially in this holiday, let us communicate that thankfulness not only to you, but to all those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.